Well, the first five books that we studied were the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then we studied the books of history, and we finished those up last week in Lesson 6. Those were 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And now we're going into the books of poetry and wisdom. And these are the books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. So this week, week seven, we're beginning with the books of wisdom and poetry. And Dr. Ken will be teaching today on the books of Job and Psalms. And so let's go over the daily readings for Job and Psalms. You'll have seven uh, daily readings for the book of Job, and then you'll also have overlapping readings for the Psalms. And, uh, you know, the 150 Psalms, that's a lot of material to cover. And also the book of Job has 42 uh, chapters in it. So again, a lot of material. And you're not going to get it all in seven days. You're just going to get an overview. And so it's important that you take really good notes and pay really close attention when Dr. Ken is teaching on these books because we don't want you to miss anything. Of course, you'll also want to take the answers to the questions for your daily reading as well as a copy of your notes and show them to your teacher so that they'll know that you're paying attention during the lessons and also that you're comprehending the material. And if they see maybe where there's some place where you're not comprehending things as fully as you could have, maybe they can kind of help explain that to you as well. But let's go over the daily readings for the book of Job. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. That's day 1. And the question is simply this. How is Job described in the introduction of the book? Then on day 2, you'll read Job chapter 1, verse 6, through chapter 2 and verse 10. And what did God give Satan permission to do to Job? And of course, he does this in stages, and so you'll explain that. On day 3, you'll read Job chapter 2, verses 11 and 13. Job chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, and Job chapter 11, verses 13 to 20. And what were the names of Job's three friends? And what caused Job's suffering according to his friends? On day 4, you'll read Job chapter 42, verses 7 through 9. And the question is, what did God say about Job's three friends at the end of the book? On day 5, you'll read Job chapter 9, verses 21 to 24. And you'll answer the question, did Job believe that only the wicked suffer? Or did he believe that God allows both the wicked and the innocent to suffer together? On day 6, read Job chapter 32. Read Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 11. And Job chapter 40, verses 6 to 14. What did Job say was the reason he hadn't said anything to this point in the book? In other words, Job's friends are talking. Job is just listening and remaining silent. Why did Job remain silent up until this point? And then also, why did Job finally decide to speak at this point? The other question is, is why did God rebuke Job? The seventh daily reading for the book of Job is Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, Job 42, verses 1 through 6, and Job 42, verses 10 to 17. And the question is, what was Job's response to God's rebuke? And also, how does the book end? And so those are your seven daily readings for the book of Job. And overlapping those daily readings, you'll have seven daily readings for the Psalms. First of all, uh, on day one, look at the titles of Psalm 1, Psalm 42, Psalm 73, Psalm 90, and Psalm 107 in your Bible. Though the reading assignment is just to look at the titles, you would be well served to read the Psalms themselves. But the question is this, what does the line of the song sectioned into five books mean? That's your first day. On day two, read the 100th Psalm. And how would you describe a hymn by looking at this psalm? Because remember, the Psalms were the hymn book of ancient Israel. And so how would you describe a hymn by looking at the 100th Psalm? On day three, read Psalm 13, verses 1 through 2, and Psalm 57, and verse 4. And tell us how you would describe a lament by looking at these examples. If you need to, look up the word lament in the dictionary. And then answer, how would you describe a lament by looking at these examples? On day four, read the 23rd Psalm. And the question is, how would you describe a confident psalm after reading this psalm? On day five, read Psalm 1. And the question is, how would you describe a wisdom psalm after reading this psalm? On day six, read the 105th Psalm. And your question is, how would you describe a remembrance psalm after reading this psalm? And then finally, on day 7, read Psalm 95, verses 1 to 5, and Psalm 
21 verses 1 to 7 and the question is how would you describe each category of royal psalms after reading these passages and so those are your reading assignments for this week and uh, Dr. Ken's going to teach here in a minute but before he does we're going to have a new song and this is the wisdom and poetry song Not too long ago, I had to crawl into the crawl space underneath my house to connect vents from my dryer. I don't really know why they call it a crawl space. Crawling is the one thing you can't do very well in it. There are only about two feet between the floor and the ceiling. In my house, you immediately face a bunch of wires you have to get through, and then you face your biggest challenge. A water pipe goes right through the middle of the crawl space. You have to somehow get yourself over that. Then it's about a 40-foot shinny, first to the middle of the house and then back to the area underneath the washroom. It's the furthest place in the house from the crawl space entrance. I had to kill spiders while I was down there. I got bruises all over my hips. My hair was full of dirt and spider webs when I came out. I told my wife that if I had a heart attack down there, I'm not sure that someone would have actually been able to rescue me. I like to use this as a metaphor of suffering. Many of us live in the crawl spaces below our house, or at least have experienced times when we felt like we're living under the house. Let me contrast that to what we do on the 4th of July at my house. We happen to live in La Mirada. It's one of the only cities in the Los Angeles area that allows personal fireworks to be set off on the 4th of July. 
So all the pyromaniacs in Los Angeles come to La Mirada with their legal and illegal fireworks and shoot them off. And it's just a really fun place to be on the 4th of July. So we climb up on our roof and set out a picnic blankets and take, off, take food and watch all the crazy stuff going on from our roof. We have a great time. It's really fun tradition for our family. And this corresponds to the times that you rejoice in life. What a contrast between these two situations. In life, we're sometimes suffering in the crawl space under the ground, and sometimes we're rejoicing on the roof. And of course, a lot of life has just lived in the house in between. Are any of you suffering? Are any of you cheerful? Our title for this lesson on Job and Psalms is actually taken from James 5.13. Are any of you suffering? You should pray. Are any of you cheerful? You should sing praises. Today, I wonder if you are in the crawl space under the house, or maybe you're rejoicing on the roof. The book of Job focuses on the first question, are any of you suffering? The book of Psalms addresses both the first and the second questions. Are any of you suffering? Are any of you cheerful? Let's look at that first question. Are any of you suffering? Our new song walks us through the story of Job. Job possessed integrity. Job's a righteous man whom Satan wants to see fall. Satan put him to a test after getting leave from God. So twice Satan approaches God and asks for permission to strike Job, first by taking away everything that he cherished and second by striking him with a painful illness. God gives him permission. Three friends said that Job was suffering for his own sins. That is, three so-called friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, show up. The only really good thing that they do is that they sit in silence for a long time before they say anything. But once they start talking, they try to convince Job that the reason he's suffering is because he's sinned. This is their basic worldview, like it has been in lots of places in the world. You sin, you suffer. You do good things, you get blessed. Since Job is suffering, his friends assume that he must have sinned. But Job maintained his righteous stand. Job counters that people don't always suffer when they sin, and some people who are suffering are not suffering as a result of sin. Young Elihu spoke. A young man decides to speak up and give his piece partway through the book. Some of what he says is different from the three so-called friends, but after a while it seems like he cycles back and starts saying the same things that the first three friends were saying. But God's word thundered last. Finally, in the book, God speaks out of a storm, a whirlwind, an incredible challenge, saying things like, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? What do you know about the world? Why would you try to challenge me? I'm God and you're not. No humans have a right to challenge God. And God restored his life again. At the end of the book, God vindicates Job and restores his health to him. So the question is, from the book of Job, how should we approach suffering? Answer number one from Job. God often doesn't tell us why we are suffering, though he does tell us that it isn't always because of sin. He doesn't tell us why in the book of Job we suffer. He does tell us that sin is not the only reason that people suffer, which is one of the main reasons that Job was written. The author of Job is countering the common assumption of his day that people always got exactly what they deserved prosperity if they were good, and suffering if they sinned. But you know, there are a variety of reasons that people suffer, including things we can't see, like Satan trying to do things to mess with people's lives. Job is helpful in reminding us that there are things happening that we can't always see. They're happening sometimes in the heavenlies, and that is part of the explanation in Job for why we suffer. Still, at the end, when God speaks up and we're expecting him to give a final answer about why people suffer, God doesn't give the simple answer that we're looking for. We're looking for an answer at the end of the book, but it isn't there. This is hard for some of us. This is probably the greatest piece of literature ever written on suffering, and God doesn't give us the answer we're looking for. But God is God, and he doesn't have to answer all of our questions. And in the case of suffering, he sometimes doesn't. So the first answer to the question of why do we suffer is, God doesn't always tell us. Okay, back to the question we're working on. How should we approach suffering? Answer number two from Job. God wants us to trust in his wisdom even when we suffer. 
when God does finally speak, his answer is basically, I know what I'm doing. I'm the creator, and who are you to question it? Here are two examples of many at the end of the book of Job. Job 38, 36. Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Or Job 39, 26. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? We have to trust in God's sovereign wisdom. All right, let's continue on with our question. How should we approach suffering? Here's an answer from the book of Psalms. God wants us to pray about our suffering. The book of Psalms is full of one type of psalm called a lament. It's one of the most common types of psalms. In a lament, the person is, who's praying lays out in the presence of the Lord what kind of suffering he is experiencing. He says, God, this is what I'm facing. This is awful. Help me. A lot of the laments also express confidence that God will hear the prayer and help him. Often there's great emotion involved and he pleads with God to defend his case. And we're invited to share in this suffering with him. So as James asks, are any of you suffering? What should you do? Bring your complaint and lay it out in the presence of the Lord. Tell him what you're experiencing. Ask him to help you and express confidence that he'll hear your prayer. When I was in the crawl space underneath the house, I kept calling up to my wife on the cell phone to tell her that I was alive or to ask her to help me by bringing me something. One time, nobody picked up the phone, so I started banging on the floor and shouting for help. That's a lament. We're crying out to God to help us. Now back to our question. How should we approach suffering? Here's an answer from the New Testament. We can know that God does understand. For Christians, the most important answer to the problem of suffering is that God himself took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. He suffered and died a horrible death on the cross. He carried all the sins of humanity on his shoulders. You know, people often challenge Christians by throwing the problem of suffering at them. You know, why does God allow people to suffer? How can he be an all-powerful God and a good God at the same time? Now, without going into it, we need to see that this question is often not motivated by a philosophical problem for people. Sometimes it is, but many times it's not. It's not, why does God allow suffering in general? It's, why did God allow my sister to suffer? Or why is God allowing me to suffer? It's very personal. Many times what underlies the question is the assumption that God is way out there and really doesn't understand my problems. He's the one who created everything but doesn't really understand how much I'm suffering. And the answer to that question is that God does understand. In the person of Jesus Christ, he suffered a terrible death. He is not some distant God out there. He knows what it is to live and die, to love and lose, and he really does understand our suffering. So sometimes we find ourselves in the crawl space under the house, and sometimes we're having a great time watching the fireworks from the roof. What should our response be in each situation? James 5.13 again. Are any of you suffering? You should pray. Are any of you cheerful? You should sing praises. So this brings us to question number two. Are any of you cheerful? What should you do about that? The simple answer is just what James says. You should sing praises. Are you cheerful? Express it. Enter into that rejoicing. Now, this is important for me because when I was younger in my faith, things that were on my radar as being really important issues in the Christian life were things like prayer and witnessing to others and forsaking all to follow Jesus and radical discipleship, things like that. But I was lacking some things that are really biblical, like love and joy. But it was as I kept reading the Bible that I realized that those types of things are really, really important in the Bible. Besides, I have a bit of a tendency to be melancholy anyway. And so joy has become very important in my life, to sing praises and to rejoice even more than I used to. If you want to learn how to praise and rejoice in the Lord, there is no better place in all of the world to go than the book of Psalms, what is often called the Psalter. Let's talk about the organization of the Psalms for a minute. Our song lays out how they're organized. The organization of the Psalms, the Psalms, all 150, sectioned into five books. How many chapters are there in the book of Psalms? 
If you said 150, that's not quite right. Actually, there are no chapters in the book of Psalms. If you look in your Bible, there won't be any chapters. It will just say Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3. It's just a collection of individual Psalms. But there are five divisions of the Psalms, usually referred to as books. You'll get a look at this on your homework this week. Uses of the Psalms for festivals and courts and prayer. Some of the Psalms were used at times of festivals. Some of them seem to have focused more on the types of activities that would have taken, around, taken place around a king's court. And of course, they were used in various situations for prayer, both public and private, after, of course, they had been memorized since people didn't just carry around their Bibles with them. Types of Psalms. Okay, let's walk through this. Hymns. Laments. We mentioned laments just a minute ago. And confidence psalms. Wisdom psalms. And remembrance psalms. Kingship psalms. And thanksgiving psalms. These are some of the various types of psalms. Probably the seven main categories. Now there are some other types of psalms, but most of them fall into these categories. I'm not going to walk through them right now with you. But when you're doing your homework, look at the examples I've given to you and see if you can identify some of the traits of these different kinds of psalms. Okay, the authors of the psalms. About half of them are authored by David. That's 73 out of 150. Asaph is also an author, around a dozen. Another dozen or so are by the sons of Korah, that is, the descendants of Korah. There are also two by Solomon, four by Jeduthun, and one each from Heman, Eton, and Moses. So what should you do if you're cheerful? You should rejoice by singing praises. The New Testament actually confirms that we should use psalms in this way. When we're joyful, we should rejoice in the Lord in public worship. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, and that's probably a reference to the psalms of Israel, especially the Psalter, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Let me ask you a different question. How should we relate to each other, some who are either in the crawl space underneath the house and some who are enjoying the fireworks on the roof? Romans 12, 15 tells us how. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. If someone is rejoicing, don't tell them to come down into the crawl space with you. Ask God to give you the grace to rejoice along with someone who is rejoicing. I mean, some of us just drag down other people. Don't do that. The Bible clearly tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice. And if someone is suffering, don't be like, oh, I can't go there with them because I'm having a good day and I don't want to ruin my day. Go ahead and get down in the crawl space with them. Bring them some tools to help them or a glass of water if they're thirsty. Go ahead and weep with them. Don't pour salt on their wounds by telling them just to get over it. And sometimes we need to do both at the same time. I grew up in a really musical family. We had two pianos in our house, and both of them were usually going by about 5.30 in the morning. My sister is an extremely accomplished pianist who was amazing in high school. One of my very best friends was also a phenomenally good pianist. It turns out that they both decided to try out for the San Francisco Bay Area Youth Symphony Concerto Competition, which that year had announced that they were going to perform the famous Grieg Piano Concerto. For any of you who know classical music, that's the one that starts with dum da da dum da da dum da da dum da da dum Anyway, both my sister and my good friend practiced hours a day for about a year in preparation for those tryouts. They both had to send in an audition recording. I think five or ten were selected from those recordings. Then they both had to go in an audition. They actually had to play for these judges. And they both did phenomenally well and were selected as the two finalists. Now I'm not going to tell you which one won. I still get choked up about it when I think about it now. One of them, either my best friend or my sister, won the competition. The other one was the runner-up. And this meant that the other one actually had to go and listen as the first one played with the symphony orchestra in front of hundreds of people from the San Francisco Bay Area. Because if the first one had gotten sick, the second one would have had to step in and play the concerto for them. Let me tell you, with one of them, the day we found out, we hugged and screamed for joy together. 
and with the other one we literally wept together. I truly and really rejoiced with the one who won and literally wept alongside of the one who lost. Are any of you suffering? You should pray. Are any of you cheerful? You should sing praises. These are good responses. Today I've drawn our responsive prayer out of Psalm 43, 1-5. It's actually a lament and starts out with crying out to God in the midst of suffering, but it ends with an affirmation of trust. I'll just pray it line by line and you pray it after me. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and upon the lyre I shall praise you. O oh God, my God, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. Amen.